It's mid-March and not quite warm enough for planting in Virginia's Blue Ridge Mountains. But for seed keeper Desiree Shelley Flores, between her three kids, graduate school, and her garden, there's never a free moment. Gardening is really a year-round practice. She started growing these tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants back in January. Desiree is a native of Baltimore, but as her family grew, they decided to move to Catawba, a town outside of Roanoke. In 2017, my husband and I moved here. Uh, a large portion of that was to be closer to our tribal, my tribal community, which is the Monacan Indian Nation, and to be within um, what we call Yesa, sometimes also called Tutulosaponi, um, ancestral homelands. So I wanted to be sort of in that area, um, be able to introduce my kids to that part of their ancestry. Desiree's been gardening since she was a kid and even helped start an indigenous garden at the University of Maryland, where she was a student. I think it was at that point I realized there's so much I don't know about our seeds and about our history. Um, so after graduating, um, I began to get more involved with like indigenous um, traditional life ways and food ways. Eventually, Desiree connected with the Alliance of Native Seed Keepers, a network of indigenous people committed to cultivating ancestral seeds. Members of the Alliance plant and grow them, then share them to ensure the indigenous seeds survive. Alliance members are mainly based in the Mid-Atlantic region, but spread up into the Northeast and even into Canada. A lot of these seeds were being housed um, with seed companies that not within the indigenous communities. People will still talk about tutelo corn because that's what they've called it, is tutelo strawberry corn. And they say, well, the people who used to grow this corn are extinct and that they're like seed keeping it for them in their memory, you know, sort of romanticizing the memory of indigenous people. And that does a lot of harm to our communities. Victoria Ferguson, a Monacan elder, grew up on the West Virginia side of the Blue Ridge and now lives in Roanoke. She learned how to keep seeds from her mother. Uh, years ago, my mother started putting them in, in envelopes and just writing the names on the seeds. And that's why you'll see some of the envelopes here, because it's something that she used to always do. Victoria has been keeping seeds for decades. In her collection today, she prizes her batch of tutelo strawberry corn, which she's been growing for six years. I really, really like the color of them and how they look when they're growing. She says the seeds are so precious that she's never even tasted the corn because once eaten, the seeds are gone. And so uh, I save almost any seed I could possibly save at this point in time. But it, my um, father used to always say it's better to have and not need than to need and not have. Victoria recalls walks in the woods with her father and siblings. And as he's walking through, he would identify different plants he would tell them the use of it. He taught them how to mark their trails so they wouldn't get lost and they can get back home. Following generations of racism, segregation, and land loss endured by Native people, Victoria laments the loss of connection to tribal places, but she still cherishes what her parents taught her about living in harmony with nature and still keeps the traditions alive. You know, my father made sure we built these little ridges to put our seeds in and uh, how he stepped off the garden and he had this stick that he used to put a hole in the ground where the corn seeds would grow. And so just being involved with that from the time that I was five, so I still plant my corn and beans together like I was taught from my early age. Victoria taught her own children and now teaches students at Virginia Tech the same method she learned as a young girl. She started an indigenous garden on campus in 2014. From one Virginia college campus to another, researchers at William & Mary are using high-tech tools to enhance ancient knowledge and build food sovereignty. Food sovereignty is the concept that a community would be completely self-sufficient on their own, being able to grow their own food commodities, um, whether that be livestock, crops, um, aquatic um, animals, uh, being able to support their community and the growth of their community sustainably. Troy Weepungwe is part of a group designing an AI-powered computer program for Virginia's tribes. The program connects ancient and modern agricultural knowledge to predict the best place for crops to grow, how much that location will yield, and the cost of production. 
and we're going out into the communities to talk about what types of foods they're currently eating and what do they think are traditional foods and what would they like to be seen grown on tribal lands if they were to engage in a food sovereignty project uh, is getting a conversation going that's incredibly important for this uh, resurgence uh, of indigenous food. I see technology as an enhancement of what's happened in the past uh, with the ability to do real-time kind of uh, evaluation uh, to ensure that we can continue to move forward uh, either in the way that our ancestors have done it or in a way that is set for the modern age. Just down the road from William and Mary, the focus turns from sustenance to the sacred. Tobacco is used in our community in a way it's more ceremonial and seen more as medicinal. Historian Chris Costello, who is Cherokee, shares his knowledge about American Indian life in the 18th century at Colonial Williamsburg. These are the tobacco seed pods. Now you can fit uh, about 50,000 tobacco seeds within uh, one teaspoon. Chris was faced with a challenge all seed keepers deal with. In order to cultivate the seeds, you have to plant them. But there's always the risk that what you plant won't survive. He started with just 100 tobacco seeds, and his efforts to save them have been a success. So I was able to provide tobacco to not only my own community directly, but the larger native community in Virginia. Chris is growing the indigenous tobacco at Colonial Williamsburg to teach visitors about its historical and cultural significance. It's typically taboo to purchase something like that. So you'd want to grow it yourself, harvest it yourself, or be gifted it. And so it's just become a responsibility of mine to provide that to the community. Chris sees these renewed efforts to cultivate seeds as a kind of activism. We have had the longest interaction of colonization here in Virginia. And so those tribes here in the local area have stood the test of time and, you know, have been here on reservations for the longest period of time as well. And so being able to provide these seeds and cultivate these seeds is that form of resistance to as, all the things that we've lost throughout time to colonization. Victoria and Desiree support all efforts, both technological and natural, to reconnect communities and revive ancestral practices. Fight like you live here. You're gonna to fight to protect that land. And part of that is taking care of it because you wanna take care of it for the next generation, for those who come after you. Thank you for watching. Continue to follow Virginia news and stories by subscribing to our VPM YouTube channel.